My name is Carolyn Jones. I am the Senior Vice President of the Institute of Employment Rights and the Assistant Secretary of the Campaign for Trade Union Freedom. It's fantastic to see so many people here tonight. Sorry we didn't have enough chairs, but um, well, hopefully you will come. And I'm honoured to chair this stellar platform of speakers tonight. And the timing for this event couldn't be better. 40 years after the great miners' strike, when the state used all the forces at its disposal to wage a class war against the NUM and its industrial base. And here we are today, just a week after the electorate kicked out the shambles of a class-based Tory. <laughs> which I believe was the second lowest tier since 1885, and despite winning just 20% of the eligible vote. Of course, we all wanted to get rid of the Tories, and we all wanted a Labour government in power, but unless Labour deliver for working people, then the shift to the right will continue, and our job is to make sure that they deliver on what they promised. So, what can workers expect? What can workers expect? Well, we'll know more on the 17th of July when the government announces its programme it, via the King. God knows why, but that's how it works. Um, but tonight, our speakers will give their thoughts on what a good deal for working people should look like under a new Labour government. Of course, our eyes are very much focused on how much of the new deal for working people will be delivered. At the Institute of Employment Rights, we are protective, very protective of the new deal for working people. Unsurprisingly, because our chair here, John Hendy, and our president, Keith Ewan, uh, were fundamental in helping to draft the original version. But it's more than that. The New Deal makes economic and industrial sense, as we all know. If implemented as drafted, it would put trade unions, sectoral collective bargaining, and work the voice and power back at the centre of workplace relations in this country. It would improve the economy by putting money in workers' pockets, and it would offer hope for a better future for millions of people. Better pay, more secure jobs, a voice and power at work. That's what we need. So, will we get it? Well, let's ask our speakers. <laughs> By the way, each of you, I know we've got a big, as I say, stellar line up tonight, but we've got six minutes maximum. Uh, when you've got one minute left. So I'll move on to our speakers. Um, our first speaker tonight is Mick Whelan. Mick is the General Secretary of ASLAC and Chair of Labour Unions. Not an easy gig. He's been trying to keep them to their word on the New Deal. And what he might not well, he's done a very good job there, but he also took that fight into his industrial <laughs> sector and was one of the first unions, or the first union, to resist the uh, strictures of the Strikes Minimum Slave Service Levels Act. So I'll let you say it. Over to you, me. <laughs> Pleased to be here with so many people and what such a great panel. I will try to keep to time. But I remember coming here last year and saying what debt we owe to the people that aren't being the architects of this deal. And Carolyn's quite right, so I think we put our hands together for Andrew MacDonald, John Henry, that being at the heart of, I've argued for a new deal for all workers in whatever form it should come. 
And why? Let's go backwards first before we go forwards. Why do we need it? We need it because we have the worst trade union laws in Europe outside of Lithuania. We need it because 14 million people are in poverty. We need it because 1 million people are in destitution. And we need it because work should pay and workers should have a voice. But at the same time then, in any 21st century democracy, the prison officers and other great groups are excluded from striking or having a voice, never mind the minimum service levels crap they've got upon us, should have the same rights as any other worker to stand up and fight for their conditions, their safety and their futures. I think Stephen will do that for us. Now, my ideal view of this is his purest form, the pamphlet that was written, the work that Andy MacDonald did. The trouble is you put eight or nine general secretaries in a room, they start looking at their sectors, what they want, they start talking with the party about what they need. Don't believe everything you hear about it being watered down. Some of that's been done to protect workers in different sectors. But at the end of the day, what we actually need is to be there when we write the legislation. What we actually need to be there is to put it in place for the civil servants not to wore it down, not to take it apart, and do whatever. At its simplest, right, the nuclear was transformative. If we achieve 40, 50, 60% of it, right, we've overturned the 2016 Trade Union Act. We've overturned Maggie's laws. We've overturned Maggie's grandchildren and the MSLs and the right to strike and the other voices they're trying to take away. But we don't want that. We're trade unionists. We're greedy. We want more. We want all of it. And don't believe we'll get it all in one hit. But if we get the bulk of it and then build upon it, and this parliament and hopefully a parliament later, then obviously for our children and our grandchildren, they'll have a voice that we haven't had for a number of years. Whether you're an affiliated trade union or not an affiliated trade union, surely all our options are about what people can do, what they've a right to do, but also what they've a right to do for each other. I believe we've seen in the last three years, the post-COVID world, trade unions working together. Whether they have secondary action or not, we've been on the same platforms. We've been making the same fight. We've been arguing that regardless of age, work should pay. We've been arguing that everybody has a right to stand with each other and fight in civil society or in a trade union bloc for their politics and their voice. And this is the first stepping stone to where we need to go. And I'll tell you now, that while I'm chair of Chulo, I will hold their feet to the fire. I will achieve everything we can achieve and put it in the right place. And I believe that every other trade union leader I've spoken to recently in that group is on the same page. We are going in the right direction. <laughs> the real complexity of this, though, is people believe that the word repeal means change everything. I think John can articulate this far better than I can because he had to explain it to me. I just said, get rid of the fucking rock. <laughs> <laughs> no more Tory shit, let's get gone, right? Let's go where we need to be. No, no, no. He said, Mick, there are bits that we need. Yeah. There are bits that trade unions require. <laughs> and then Andy had come and explained to me as well, one or two others, because I'm a bit of an old fashioned industrial trade unionist. It's either right or it's wrong. But sometimes to be right, then we need to keep the bits that we require for our right to strike, for our right to have that voice, to build upon the things that have been taken away and understand that we then have the legal right not to be attacked as trade unions, not to be sequestered, not to be hurt, and not to be damaged because the people that we represent have been hurt and we dare to articulate what they need to do. And part of that problem then becomes then when we listen to the press. There will be a massive push by the CBI, the Institute Directors, Tufton Street, all sorts of groups that I don't belong to and never want to. <laughs> right? Trying to change this. Not because they believe what actually their own data tells them. Their own data tells you we have sexual violence and debt conditions. Right? You get less turnover. And it's more economic for the productivity of the company you work for. That is their own data. The National Audit Office tells us that. The government's own figures tell us that. So why then? In the 21st century, where work doesn't pay, why shouldn't it pay? We have a problem now where many of the people that are claiming income support are working 48 hours a week or more. If work paid, it's only the working class and middle class that use their disposable income. They spend it. They spend it and they grow 
the local economy, they grow the national economy, they grow the economy everywhere. Take away the ability for people to spend, right, have the choice to spend, right, takes away from any national growth that you want to have. And what we have seen then is that awful figure that during the last 15 years, right, that our share of GDP has gone down from 65% to 50%. We are creating poverty rather than eradicating poverty. And we have the obvious social problems that go with it. We need to build those houses that take the cost out of it, that lower rents and our people their opportunities as well as what they do. And Carolyn just said one minute. <laughs> so my last minute. I'm actually incredibly hopeful. We have an opportunity now for them to show us that they're going to do what they said they would do. But then once they've done that, what they need to do is do more. So from this moment on, we in this room, and we in the movement, we're being civil society on trade unions, no matter if you're affiliated or not, we're going to hold this government to account, and we're going to change the world for our children, our grandchildren, and future generations, and give them the voice and the rights they should have. Thank you for listening. MSL, 
for, for mixing industry and for my industry is a fundamental threat to our right to operate, to our right to take industrial action. And even the repeal of that will give confidence to Fire Brigade Union members. And we can then say, we've done that. We now need to go further and we need to demand more. So it's that risk of simply uh, dismissing it as not going far enough, it's been watered down. Yes, there is inevitably, we're talking about the Labour Party here, for God's sake. It's inevitable that there is a battle about what is delivered and what's put in manifestos. And some of us were part and parcel of that. But the question is, can we use that opportunity now to rebuild our movement? to build a movement fit for the 21st century, for the new world of work, for the millions of people who aren't even in trade unions and frankly don't know what a trade union is. That's the task in front of us. And we have to face reality hard in its face. We used to have 12 million plus people in trade unions in 1979. We now have around 6 million people in trade unions with a much bigger workforce. That is a significant and historic setback and we need to face up to it and say we're going to use this opportunity to rebuild organisation fit for fighting back against the employers today. And that means the Amazon workers, the Uber workers, the so-called gig economy. And some people say it can't be done. I always point to the example of the East London women workers in the Brighton May factory in Bow, who were some of the most downtrodden Migrant workers, young women, looked down on, including by trade unionists. And yet they were to spark, permit the, <laughs> they were to spark by taking strike action. These people, people who thought would never join a union, they lit a spark, which the following year led to the dock strike and to the beginnings of mass trade unionism at the end of the 19th century and into the early years of the 20th century. That's the sort of vision we need to put before people today. You can change the world of work and think about how much time we spend in work during the course of a lifetime. We can make work better by being organised. The miners' strike has been mentioned, and I'll mention it tomorrow. No doubt we'll get a lot of mentions to, uh, tomorrow. The 1984-85 miners' strike. Well, let's remember, that was, as Cad said, a class offensive by the British ruling class against the most determined organised and one of the most militant sections of the trade union movement. They did it for a reason, because they wanted to send a message to the entire class you step out of line, we will come after you and we will destroy you and destroy your lives and lock you up. And we need the same level of determination in our movement as she had for her class, frankly, as Thatcher had for her class. We need fighters on our side prepared to struggle, prepared to organise, to prepared to think about the challenges that we face. And the key thing for me, and I'll finish on this point, hopefully before I get any minutes notice. The key task, rebuilding workers' power in the workplace. That's what we have to seize the opportunity that this election and those platform of workers' rights and legislation, that's what it offers us. Rebuild workers' power in the workplace. That's the challenge before all of us. Thanks very much. of the PCS. Lovely to have another woman at the top of the trade union movement. Fran has done and achieved so much in the short time that she's been general secretary and I'm sure there's much more to come. So I'm proud to welcome you here tonight. So over to you. Thanks so much. Um, to be back in Durham this weekend, but even sweeter being here just a few days after finally moving the Tories out. <laughs> it's been a long time coming, uh, to say the least, and I'm looking forward to having a drink or two with everybody celebrate this weekend. We, up here in the North East, we call this Christmas for Socialists this weekend, <laughs> and, and we're
we really hope that everybody enjoys every single minute of it. And hopefully we'll have much more to celebrate on Sunday as England look to go all the way in the Euros after their dramatic uh, win on Wednesday. And despite that success, there's been criticism that it's been a tepid, flat, some might even say uninspiring campaign that has led us to this point. But that's enough about the Labour ele general election victory. <laughs> Present company accepted, of course, Andy McDonald. <laughs> In all seriousness, it really is fantastic to get rid of the rotten Tories after 14 years. The misery and cruelty that they inflicted on the working class in this country should never, ever be forgiven or forgotten. Living standards plummeted while food bank usage soared. We saw a return to rickets in our children. A Victorian era disease born out of extreme poverty which was thought to have been consigned to the past. And the country has become ripped by the worst homelessness crisis in the developed world. I could go on, but I want to talk about what all this means to our members in PCS and how they are crying out for radical, a radical new deal on workers' rights. Because pay is a fundamental issue for our members who must endure a convoluted delegated pay system which I won't bore you with. At the moment, our pay negotiations take place across a staggering 200 separate bargaining areas just within the civil service. It is a completely broken system that drives down wages and entrenches pay inequality. Civil service wages are lower now than they were in 1975, and that has resulted in an astonishing cumulative loss of pay of between 13,000 and 16,000 pounds. And even though progress has been made on the gender pay gap, it's still only slightly more below double figures at 9.1%. And when people think about civil servants, they think about those bowler-hatted tea drinkers that um, wear their pin side suits, when in fact the reality is 46% of our membership are now in receipt of universal credit or entitled to claim it. The outlook for disabled civil servants is more alarming with the disability pay gap standing at 8.4% and widening over time. We have heard first-hand in harrowing detail just what it means. The reality is that some civil servants, the government's own workers, let's remind ourselves, are living in cold, dark homes, struggling to feed themselves or to put food on their children's, in their children's bellies. Our own research, as I say, shows 46% of them are now using food banks and 30% are skipping, 30,000 rather, are skipping meals. These are startling figures and it simply cannot go on. And that is why fixing the broken pay system should be a top priority for the Labour government. We're calling for the establishment of proper collective bargaining machinery on pay at a national level for the civil service and its related areas. And that would include single pay spines for all workers. Our long-held position is of course shared by the IER, whose valuable manifesto for labour law is a blueprint for labour government's approach to workers' rights. PCS members have endured object to spare at the hands of this pay system that needs fixing and it needs fixing now. Elsewhere we're calling for an end to the scourge of outsourcing in the civil service just like the broken pay model. Civil service outsourcing is a key driver of inequality particularly on gender and race and that is because outsourced workers in the civil service are predominantly black. Many are women who are employed on far inferior contracts than their in-house colleagues and there's midwife Mick Lynch rightly points out, before, as pointed out before, outsourcing institutionalises racism. It's where class and race intersect, with black workers being paid less and enjoying worse terms and conditions than those employed directly. This is something I've seen myself in the numerous disputes we've had with privateers that are leeching off the civil service. We've had stunning victories amongst our outsourced workers and we're hoping to add another one to the list within two weeks. ISS workers at the Department for Net Zero in Whitehall will walk out for four days. And that is the first major test for the Labour government and one of their manifesto pledges. Those members soon to be on strike will have seen this commitment and Labour's promise to carry out the largest wave of insourcing in a generation. So let's hope that pledge this is stuck to you, because to paraphrase Keir Starmer, what the people of this country need isn't slogans, it's a government that can change lives. The issues I've discussed this evening are by no means exhaustive, far from it. Alongside the issues others on the panel have highlighted, this is just the start. Because it goes without saying that all the anti-union legislation has to go, including the minimum service levels. 
Our demands need to be bolder, more radical on workers' rights. Let's apply maximum pressure to ensure that a Labour government will engage with us on those building blocks as we look ahead to this new political era. So as we celebrate everything that makes the trade union movement uh, the marvel that it is this weekend, and Durham really does do that, let's also demand that those in power transform this country into one that fills the working class with hope and optimism for the future. Because after being shackled for so long, our members and the movement cannot be let down again. Have a great weekend, everybody. Solidarity. Thanks very much, Zafran, and thanks for the plugs for the Institute publications. We've got a selection at the back, by the way, if anyone wants to buy a booklet on the way out. Um, and move swiftly on, our next speaker is Steve Gillen. He is the General Secretary of the Prison Officers Association. Prisons, as you'll know, are very much in the news again at the moment. Uh, no doubt the government will be calling on Steve's members to assist with the current chaos, while at the same time denying them the right to strike outrageous. But I will give your speech to Steve, I'll leave it to you. Over to you, Steve. And the reality is, I'm going to go on a positive, but with the health warning that comes at the end. I'm absolutely delighted that we've kicked the Tories out with such a massive majority for a Labour government. But it will mean nothing, actually, if they don't enact uh, a new deal for workers and eradicate uh, some of the punitive measures uh, that trade unions have been suffering. Uh, since the Thatcher era, quite frankly. So I'm going to pay tribute, obviously, to the IER, who have produced documents, uh, John Hendy, Andy McDonald, the affiliated unions, Thompsons, and everybody else that was involved in putting uh, this sort of manifesto together. But they need to deliver. And they need to, they need to deliver for working people. Above all, they need to deliver for my members. My members have suffered through a Labour government, a Conservative government, a coalition government. For the last 30 years, we've not had the right to strike. It's an absolute disgrace. And I've got to say, that right, sorry, that wrong needs to be righted. For the simple reason that we can't continue. My union is under a permanent injunction. My union has been found guilty of contempt of court for taking action to protect our members. And let me say clearly now, we will continue to take action if the issue is right under health and safety legislation, because that's all we've got there. And we will do that. <laughs> we will do that irrespective of what the law says, because the reality is there has been issues over the last 30 years and we have never repudiated an action that any of our local branches take. And even after the contempt of court, where we got fined, some of our branches have taken action under health and safety, but we've never highlighted it. But I'm quite pleased to highlight it tonight, quite frankly, because we will always defend our members at work, and we'll take no backward step from that. But we have an opportunity, this Labour government has a massive majority. So they should deliver for working people. And I'll tell you why they should deliver for working people. Because if they don't, they allow the populists, such as reform, to control the narrative. And we cannot allow that to happen. It is no use anybody pointing at people who voted reform and calling them all racists. That is not correct. Because the reality is people vote in certain ways because they've lost faith in the system. They come from backgrounds where there's no decent housing, no decent jobs, no decent infrastructure, and you get a populace coming forward to say we've got an easy solution to complex issues and that we're on your side. Forget about the main parties. You're one of us and I'm one of you. Farage can say all he wants. He is not one 
for working class people but we should not dismiss them what we should do and what this Labour government should do the assistance of trade unions is defeat that narrative that they portray about immigrants and so forth the reality is immigrants didn't create poor housing immigrants didn't create poor jobs immigrants weren't responsible for not building enough hospitals or schools or whatever the people that were guilty of that were politicians and existing governments so labor has an opportunity to change all that and i hope they grasp that nettle and have some quick wins and let me tell you this nonsense that i keep hearing there's no money well in the words of tony ben they can always find money for wars that's the reality they can always find money for wars Rachel Reeves says that uh, it's all tanked, there's no money for this, there's no money for that. It's the worst economy since the World War II. Well, guess what happened after World War II? We created the NHS, we created council houses, we created full employment. Let's go back there if that's what she's saying. Because if you put money in people's pockets, they will stimulate the economy. It's no use saying they'll give no money because we don't believe it. It won't cost a single penny to restore trade union rights to the PRA. Not a penny. The Scottish Government did it in Scotland, but the sky didn't cave in. So I say to this Labour Government, be brave, be bold, be on the side of workers. We'll see off reform, because if we deliver, the British people will be voting Labour for generations to come. It's that simple. It's that simple, it's not difficult. But as we're here on the 40th anniversary of the mining strike, I pay tribute to them. I pay tribute to them because that's where a lot of it started. And in fact, if the trade union movement then were brave and stood against Thatcher, we were defeated Thatcherism and we could have had a better world. So we can't look back in anger but what we can do is create a future that's fit for all. So that our children and our grandchildren have a better future. With proper rights at work. With decent housing. We shouldn't be afraid to call it council housing because that's what we need. Not affordable housing, not all that nonsense. This sort of affordable housing, people are being charged 1,600 quid a month to get a roof <laughs> over their heads. People in their 30s are still living at home because there's no place to, to go. There's no hope for them. Give them hope. Let's have a Britain that takes everybody forward and not just the rich. The reality is as well, what I also want is justice for all grief. Yeah. And i finish on this by sticking together Matt mentioned it a couple of minutes ago when he said about the trade union movement, about five billion members. What about all those members, potential members that are out there working? We need to organise, and sometimes I blame the trade union movement for not having the initiative. We also have fish in the same pond to get members, and I should know that because the reality is I've been asked to sit on three different dispute panels for the TUC. It's about men, about organisation, having a pop at another organisation for coaching members. Go out and organise the general unions, for God's sake. There's millions of people out there that don't know what it's like to be in a trade union. So if we can do that, we can win together. <laughs>
the New Deal for workers when he was a shadow secretary for employment rights and protections. He quit the front bench, I seem to remember, um, when Star was starting to backtrack on some of the policies. I think on that one, it was most notably the introduction of a £15 an hour minimum wage. I remember it because you did it at our fringe. Um, well, well done. Anyway, welcome to Andrew McDonald. Thank you. Yeah, I'm not getting some trouble for that, that's for sure. I've been Adrian, I saw him earlier at the contact meeting, uh, but that was inevitable. Um, look, um, I'm going to just take issue with Mick Connolly's left the room. I think he was talking about you know, the election night and saying that the biggest joy in his heart was seeing Penny Morton on her way. I just sum it up in three words. Jacob Reese. <laughs> so yeah, I've been quite as high profile as I used to be. But I tell you what, the biggest joy in my heart was to hear so many candidates talk about one thing. And it was the the New Deal for Working People. Absolutely superb to see the party rally round that and make sure it was the cornerstone of our manifesto. Uh, because it speaks to people. They know it's their lived experience. They've seen what it's like to be in receipt of poverty, poverty care. Um, but before I go on a, a little bit more of that, I just want to express my thanks because yeah, okay, I was the chair of the task force that tried to corral 12 trade union leaders. Uh, you've got to think, I, you know what that is like? But to those affiliates and the non-affiliates and everybody else who contributed, a massive thanks. It was an absolute terrific effort. But, I, you know, you think, are oh, you standing on the, uh, the shoulders of giants? Well, I'm afraid I do, because there's one of them sitting along just from me. And Keith Ewing and his colleague John Hendy have been at this for decades and decades. And John, thank you so much for everything you did. Thank you for your contribution. And I see my colleagues from Thompson's that who let me have a go at it anyway. So that's uh, great to see them there. But I was here last night, uh, and we went up to uh, see the uh, "We're Not Turning Back." Uh, player. And I know many of you have seen it, uh, Women Against Pit Closures. And I tell you what, it was so emotional and inspiring to be here, 40 years on, to be enjoying this moment. Uh, and I just think about you know, why we're here, it's why we do it, for those inspirational stories. But I know what we say about the penetration of the uh, trade union movement into sectoral effective value across the economy. Yeah, what was it, John? It was over 80 percent, sort of three, four decades ago. Now, uh, 20 percent and and falling. But I tell you what, over the over the piece, because there's some of the trade union leaders here uh, who have been able to articulate such a story on behalf of their members, it has resonated with people. We have had such successful industrial action, and it counts. Uh, and I'm, I'm looking a lot, and I know Mick's gone, but Matt and uh, Fran, everybody's here. The way you've gone about your business to make sure that you're communicating, and, and Mick talks to you in Cape Early every five minutes on Sky News, <laughs> of course, it's been a joy to behold. Um, but we've, see, we've seen it in the run up to this election. Had the healthcare workers in, in my, healthcare assistants in my constituency, you know, they're there, they've been doing clinical work for decades. And they've been at long last rebounded from two to three. They're still being paid at under eleven pounds and fifty pence per hour. They're taking blood samples. They're, they're catheterizing people. They're doing all of this incredible work, and yet, when at the end of the week, they don't have enough money to live on. They can't put food on the table, and where they have to go is to the food bank inside the hospital. And it's a total outrage. What we've got to see at the end of this Labour government is the end of food banks. We've got to see the end of them completely. <laughs> and there we have the G4S security guards, the GMB members on strike. Again, under £11.50 an hour. This outsourcing 
and privatisation of public services has got to be turned on its head. We've got to see the, the biggest programme of in-service returns. Uh, but you know, let's think that through because at £11.40 pence per hour, what's the charge to the DWP by G4S? It's about £35, £36 an hour, if I'm not mistaken. You know, how the hell is that justifiable? I've heard of on cost, but this is totally and utterly scandalous. But we brought this scurrilous, disgraceful, despicable government to an end. And it just struck me in the week leading up to the general election, when we heard the story of another £1.4 billion pounds worth of PPE that those robbing bastards took from us during the first episode. I just just want to tell you this because when I, when I was in the shadow cabinet before things happened, but anyway, um, what we did hear from Sir Michael Marmot, and he was asked the question, you know, he gave us this exposition about poverty, child poverty, and it was superb. And the question asked of him, so well, how do we translate that into uh, an offer that the public can in engage with? And he did say, well, that's your job, not mine. Uh, but if you need advice from me, it's simply this. Tell the truth about what's gone wrong and be bold about how to fix it. And that's what should inspire a Labour government. In this document, because the work of people like uh, John, we will address the issue of single status. That alone will transform the world of work. If people are taken away from those bogus self-employments uh, and zero-hour contracts, and people are in good, secure, well-paid, unionised work, their lives become immeasurably better. They can plan, they can have secure lives, flourishing lives. They can also be taxpayers and national insurance contributors. And the benefit to the Treasury is 10 billion quid a year. Just think what that can do for our social care agenda. Honestly, uh, comrades, this is in front of us. This is the opportunity. And I can assure you, you know, that this will be in the King's speech. People are already at it, and we've got to make sure, and we will be watching, that every single element of what we were trying to achieve is there. And so rest assured that the work is not done. We can't rest our laurels now. We've got, we've got a shiny document and a promise of implementation. We've got to hold people to account and make sure it absolutely is implemented in its full. And if we can do that, this can be transformation of our country. Thank you very much. <laughs> Highlighted the urgent need for political and economic transformation. 
whilst many in our communities would argue, and we've had these conversations over the last few weeks, there is no difference in the main political parties, and ask what is the point in politics, which, you know, which is why, as Steve mentioned, reform took a hold like they did. Our members are politically engaged and determined to see change. They are not content with the status quo. The issues that they face are not unique to our sector, but reflect broader societal changes, the cost of living crisis, which makes it difficult for families to afford basic necessities like food, energy, and housing. Unsurprisingly, when our members remain concerns, a crisis that has been compounded in our sector by low pay, poor management practices, and insecure working conditions. In the workplace, our members, like many of yours, are grappling with low wages, bullying management styles, unsafe working conditions, insufficient staffing. They are asked to do more with less, often under the strain of unsociable hours and insecure contracts. Our survey results clearly outline what our members believe is necessary to address these challenges, and their voices we shaped into the Baker's Dozen Manifesto of 13 Key Demands that we will continue to advocate for with the new Labour government. £15 an hour minimum wage, because everyone deserves a living wage, regardless of their age. This will end the unfair youth limit on national minimum wage. Abolish zero hours contracts. We demand that there is job security and predictability for all workers, and that this should be all zero hours contracts that are banned, because each and every single one of them in the wrong hands can be exploitative. And we've seen that in the last 12 months in the lot of stuff that's happened with McDonald's and further. Full employment rights from day one. All workers should have their rights protected from the moment they start their job. They shouldn't have to wait, it should be from day one. Contractual sick pay 100%, employers should be provided at least six weeks of full pay, of full wages to workers when they're ill, because you don't need that additional burden and stress of not being able to pay your bills when you're already dealing with ill health. We've covered repealing anti-union legislation because we need the freedom to organise and advocate without restrictive laws. Maximum workplace temperature, we're coming into summer again, although the last few days haven't really <laughs> felt like it. You know, legislation is needed to ensure that there are safe working conditions that are comfortable for workers, especially in our industry. Can you imagine stood next to an oven when it's 40 degrees outside? Accountability for company failures. Companies must not be able to evade their financial responsibilities through administration loopholes, leaving members and workers destitute as a result. Public ownership of utilities, it goes without saying, we should all be advocating for that, shouldn't we? A right to food, a statutory right to food, free school meals, a cap on supermarket profits are essential to combat food insecurity because nobody should be going hungry in 2024 in one of the richest countries in the world. Affordable public transport. We need to renationalise the train companies. We need to cap bus fares and provide free public transport for young people at age 16 to 25. End arms sales to Israel. We've got to take a stand for human rights. and develop themselves and we need to create a national care service providing dignity and care for the elderly and vulnerable is a societal duty that we should all be fighting for these demands are not just aspirations they are essential changes that will improve the lives of not only our members but the wider community too and our collective strength and our our solidarity are our greatest assets to get us there we must continue to organize educate and mobilize to all those in power accountable because just because it is the Labour Party now, it absolutely does not mean we can rest on our laurels. <laughs> if we will send a clear message to our newly elected representatives. We will not accept empty, empty promises or half measures. We demand real change and we're not going to rest as a movement until we see it. Together we can, in this room and beyond, build a future where every worker is treated with dignity, respect, fairness. We can't just rely on politicians to do that. We've got to do that ourselves. We've got to push 
the, the far right out and stop reform gaining any more ground. But to do that, we need to be able to do our jobs as trade unionists. We need to have access to workers. We need to be able to work together across the movement, challenge their rhetoric and show people that we are the ones. We are the ones that will support them. We are the ones that are like them, not Farage and Zilk. Thank you.
in the New Deal, which is to implement legislation to impose collective bargaining across all sectors and occupational groups in the economy. It's true that they propose such bargaining across the social care sector and for school support staff. But why pause there? The need for sectoral bargaining across the warehousing sector, the parcel and food delivery sector, school teaching, agriculture, and many others is absolutely obvious. And in contrast, this very week in Germany, the unions reached a deal with the employers in the retail sector for minimum terms across the entire retail uh, 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 sector. We could do with that. The need for sector-wide bargaining is overwhelmingly obvious, as Andy has already mentioned. From the Second World War until 1980, collective bargaining covered over 80% of the United Kingdom workforce. Now, thanks to 45 years of anti-union legislation, privatisation, outsourcing, globalisation and government policy, less than one in four of our work workers is engaged on negotiating terms and conditions. That means that the rest of the uh, workforce have their terms dictated by the employer unilaterally on a take it or leave it basis. And the result has been catastrophic for working class people. Real wages have not risen in value since 2007. Whilst inflation, though not increasing as fast as in the last couple of years, continues to rise, on average, this year at 10% per annum. Of the 6.7 million people on universal credit, 38%, that's to say 2.5 million claimants, are actually in work and earning money. So the, the scandal of universal credit is not a few people claiming benefits to which they're not entitled but the fact that 38% of the £59.8 billion pounds a year spent on universal credit is actually used to subsidise employers paying low wages. <laughs> we don't have time to talk about the rise in poverty and destitution which has followed, but I'll make Two further points, if I may, before I sit down. The first is that the collapse in collective bargaining coverage in this country reflects the loss of worker power at the workplace. Only the restoration of the collective power of workers through their trade unions will achieve a real increase in wages across the e economy. And that would have a huge effect Apart, of course, from improving the quality of life of most of the population who depend on the earnings of workers, it would increase the demand for goods and services, which would be instrumental in Rachel Reeves' hope of achieving growth in the economy. It would slash government expenditure on benefits and at the same time increase the government's tax table. Above all, it would restore some degree of democracy to the workplace so that workers' voice is heard in determining the terms and conditions in which they work out their working lives. The second point I wanted to make is that the redressing of the power imbalance at the workplace requires lifting the legal restraints on trade unions to represent their members. And that means freeing up the restrictions on the right to strike. But I see that time is running out. So unfortunately, my favorite subject, the right to strike, I cannot uh, uh, speak about this evening. So instead, I'll thank you very much for listening.
Um, she is, has kindly stepped in for Daniel Cabiday, who is speaking on any questions tonight on Radio 4. Sarah is the NEU incoming president, so welcome to you. Right, we have two speakers left. 
Um, do you want a phrase that we use down at the end? Well, I'm like, Sam, I um, so uh, our next speaker um, it was always very active in the National Education Union too as an activist. He is now General Secretary of the General Federation of Trade Unionists. He's a supporter of very many causes, not least Strike Map, who has a table at the back, and is currently involved in a joint GFTU strike map campaign for trade union freedom campaign to get rid of the Strikes Minimum Service Levels Act. I think he's here tonight to help launch the uh, Miners Next Step, but I'll leave that up to you to say it. So, we. Thank you very much, Kat, and thanks to the Institute of Employment Rights and the Campaign for Trade Union Freedom for the invitation to speak at this meeting on workers' rights after the election. And of course, the launch by Manifesto Press and Strike Map of the Miners' Next Step, reprinted with new introductions from lesbians and gays support the miners, the Albury Truth and Justice campaign, and historian Rob Turnbull. Now, what do we have to learn in this new context from a pamphlet that was written in 1911 in a very different industrial and political context? Well, the miner's next step is all about the need to build and strengthen our unions through root and branch democracy and the involvement of members at all levels. It sets its face against the policy of conciliation and it makes the case that whoever is in Westminster, our power, our strength, lies with our members. It argues that political action must go side by side, hand in hand, with industrial action. And it says that the power to vote whether or not there shall be strike action and upon industrial policy to be pursued by their union will affect far more important issues to the workers' life than the political vote can ever touch. Democracy in this country has never extended fully into the workplace and the trade union laws, the anti-union laws that tie the hands of our unions and restrict our ability to take action to defend and extend our interests just make that worse. Now I think these are crucial lessons for us in the current context. The incoming Labour government provides the opportunity for progressive advance. But it is our union strength that gives us the means to seize that opportunity and to make that advance real. It's notable that the last time this pamphlet was reprinted was actually by the South Wales miners in 1964, just before, throughout the 1970s, some of the most significant wins that our movement has seen, many of them led by the miners. And in the introduction to that reprint, the General Secretary said that this pamphlet will form the basis of weekend schools and classes throughout all of the mining villages in Wales. And that education was crucial to developing a movement that won those victories in the 1970s. Now, following the 2022-2023 strike wave, we have a huge number of new activists in our movement people who've taken strike action for the first time in their lives, stood on picket lines, supported picket lines for the first time in their lives. But now they're operating in a new context under a Labour government and everything's changed. In that context, education will be absolutely crucial to take those workers, those new activists, to our movement to develop their understanding of our trade union history, their understanding of political economy, their understanding of power and how to shift politics in this country. And investing in education, investing that in that discussion within the movement will be absolutely crucial to developing those activists. And that's why I'm also really pleased that tomorrow the General Federation of Trade Unions will be launching our brand new education programme for the coming year. It's the broadest, most diverse education programme we've ever put on and focuses on educating and empowering this new generation of, of activists to strengthen our trade union movement 
and to build, as it says in the founding aims of the GFTU from 125 years ago, to build the power of workers to determine the conditions under which they live and work. Let's build and strengthen our movement together. Institute, pick up some stuff, pick up some flyers, the campaign for trade union freedom, get your union branch to affiliate Strike Map, where you will find copies of the book. There is information from the Mark Memorial Library, excellent education courses, so that's all at the back as well. And I should also say once again, um, thank you to uh, Morris Solicitors for sponsoring and supporting this event, so thanks all very much. I'm saying that now because you're all going to die. To be about our last speaker, aren't you? So um, I thought I'd catch you then. Um, so, our last speaker, he might be last on the platform, but he's always at the forefront of industrial struggle. Um, he's, it's been said and popularly thought and considered that um, he would have been the best person to be Prime Minister, but unfortunately, it's not the one that we got. Um, so, but, but he is the General Secretary of the RMT, Mick Lynch. <laughs> But yeah, thanks so much for everybody uh, turning out. And thanks to the Institute and the campaign for everything they've done over the last, what is it, 35, 40 years? I, I had hair when we, when we started, but uh, <laughs> quite a long time ago even then. But it, it's been a remarkable journey, and hopefully we're on the foot, uh, in the foothills of something promising. We're not at the end of the journey, we're, in the, we're at the start of the journey, I think. Um, and it's been a remarkable thing that we've kept our movement going, because sometimes, we, we're down on ourselves as trade unionists, that we haven't achieved enough, that we haven't made the massive breakthroughs we're looking at, uh, looking for. But I think what we've done is keep the embers going, and it's down to the men and women of our movement, not the leaders, not the, uh, the politicians, the people who get paid to do this, but the men and women in all the workplaces all across this country that have kept this union movement alive and kept the labour movement alive. And let's not forget there are some people in power now who are part of a campaign to end the Labour movement, to the end of the idea that there would be a trade union political side, a trade union industrial side, and a trade union cultural side, which is why we're here this weekend to celebrate our working class history and our working class culture and our working class identity. But we're not the Democratic Party. We're not lined up with the other forces of professional politics. We are an independent workers' movement, and we believe in socialism. That's what we want to achieve, not just minor reforms. <laughs> we want to change the society. <laughs> and I'm very proud that my union has socialism in its rules, and the job description of the General Secretary is to carry out the rules. So it's in my job description to achieve socialism. <laughs> But it's important. We're not going to carp, and I've been saying this to our national executive, and there's a few of them in the room tonight, so I've got to be careful what I say. They're always monitoring me. We're not going to carp about what Labour's going to do. We're realistic. We know what the people are like that have taken power. They're not the people that will be sitting in a room like this tonight, giving up their time. They are people that are professional politicians who want to run the country on a bit of a spectrum of a consensus. Well, that's not the game we're in. That's why we're going to be slightly cynical, but we will be polite and professional. And all of the unions, Dan, Daniel's been in there this week, all of the unions have had calls from ministers, secretaries of state, ministers of state. The RMT's been in with the Ministry of Defence this week about a dispute we've got in the Royal Fleet Auxiliary. I had a personal phone call from the Secretary of State of Defence, something I never thought would happen in my entire life, <laughs> but that was good. And we've been in with the Secretary of State and the Minister of State for Transport. These are all good things, and it's certainly better than what it was like only, what, seven weeks ago. 
I want to thank Richard and Richard Sunak, by the way, for organising this whole thing. So we came to uh, the Mind of Game. celebrate with the, that part of the movement in Ireland that's uh, got rid of the shackle of direct rule in the last few months from a Conservative government that was screwing the, the Northern Irish economy to the ground and was opposed through almost a general strike of the Northern Ireland trade unions during this period. That we so things are looking up and I'm not going to go through what everyone said, I'll share completely that the idea that it's not going to all come to us in one go. There is so much to do. We're all from different industries, different parts of the economy, different unions. Everywhere you look, this country is in a crisis. And I'll tell you why it's in a crisis. It's not an accident. It's not just crept up on us organically. It is a design of the ruling class of this country. And the mechanism has been, mechanism has been 45 years of continuous Thatcherism. The, re the reason we've got these problems in our country, the state of our housing, the state of our health service, the state of education, the state of social care, the state of our local authorities, wherever you look, is because we've had unabated Thatcherism under Conservative governments and under New Labour for 14 or 15 years. And it's our job now to turn that round. And what we've done over the last three or four years through the disputes is to show that the ideas of collectivism, the ideas of solidarity, the ability to fight back on our terms is not dead in this country. It's not a thing in the history books and in the museums and on our banners. It's alive now in our working people, in our activists, in our rank and file members and in our communities. And it's our job as trade unionists to take those embers and fan them into a fight, into a resistance, to look at the main prize, which is to transform this country. Transform this country to the way we want it, to a fair society, to an equal society, to a society that gives power to the men and women of this country, and a society that stands for peace in our world and supports the people that are looking for their own liberation around the world in the way that we may have it in the future of this country. So that's the job we've got to do. Look up to the bigger prize. The people that formed our movement didn't just want piecemeal reforms. They wanted to change our society, to abolish poverty, to educate ourselves, to build uh, instruments in our country that stand forever the welfare state, the NHS, council provision, all of those things must come back. And we must build a government over the next 10 or 15 years that makes it impossible for the Tories to win. It makes it impossible for Thatcherism to come back and destroy our towns, cities and communities. So that's the job in front of us. So we will always encourage Labour to do good. We always encourage them to do more. But if they don't do enough, in a reasonable time scale, we will resist them just the way we've resisted the Tories all the time. So let's clarify the next week that all of our, our gatherings, all of our culture right around the country, and I can tell you now, it is coming back. In Ireland, I've been to three festivals in the last three years, uh, last year. Uh, the Mother Jones Festival in Cork about the history of Irish trade unionism in America, the Robert Tressel, Tressel Festival in, in Dublin, about the, the ragged trousers for anthropists and what went on before. We've got a James Conley Festival coming up in Belfast in the next few weeks. We need this banners held high in Yorkshire, the Merthyr rising down in South Wales. We need more stuff going on in Scotland. We need to remember our history, value our history, so it can take us forward into the next period. So come to these meetings, lift up your hearts, enjoy yourself. This is a period of opportunity for us as working people. Push these politicians in the direction we want them to go, in the direction that our people need them to go. We are on the cusp of something significant. It's in our hands, the rank and file of our movement. Build the movement out of the trade unions, into your communities, help 
the people that are looking after the, after the, uh, the, the environment. Help the people that are struggling against poverty. Help everyone in every community around Britain. It's our movement. Broaden it, build it, strengthen it, and then let's win for our people. Thank you very much.